Jim, thanks for sitting down with me today. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Jim, can you tell me a little bit of the, about the work that you do at the USDA and the Agricultural Research Service? Sure. Our work uh, involves the genetic diversity of corn. So corn is a very genetically diverse crop. Very little of that diversity is actually used by uh, hybrids grown by farmers in the U.S. though. So what we're trying to do is evaluate varieties from other places in the world that are quite different than what we grow here in the U.S., try to identify useful varieties or useful genes carried in those varieties and try to breed those useful genes into material that's adapted well and could be then uh, introduced into commercial type varieties for U.S. farmers. Right. There's a number of global organizations that are continue to be concerned about uh, biodiversity. Can, can you just talk a little bit, and, and I guess especially when it comes to corn, can you talk, is, is there justification in this concern? Or why or why not? I think there is. I think um, if you look at the Again, the genetic diversity that's available worldwide in maize, uh, they can be classified, corn can be classified into something like 300 different races or kind of like breed types, if you were, like dogs. So it would be like in the US we have one kind of dog. We have one kind of corn and there's many other types that are out there that could be useful for, for, for farmers in the US. So um, we think it is an issue um, and there are cases where we think long term, we think it would be useful to have new kinds of genes for improved yield performance, drought performance, nitrogen efficiency. There are also cases that we know about now where there's diseases that have not appeared in the U.S. but have popped up in Africa, for example, maize lethal necrosis virus. Almost all the germplasm is susceptible. There are a few varieties that are, have some good resistance, but you have to screen through a lot of diverse material before you find those things. So I think we want to be ahead of the game and make sure we have a diverse but adapted germplasm base to make sure the corn crop is really safe and productive. So it's been said that with precision agriculture and, and, and lots of the advancements in the new breeding technologies, there's more varieties being developed for specific geographies. We know this to be true. Does this actually lead to more genetic diversity? Is that actually possible that that generates more genetic it diversity? It could. Um, it's, that kind of increase in genetic diversity is pretty small relative to what I'm talking about in terms of a much larger increase in the genetic base. Um, and that always is, you're right, that there are, the, the seed companies would like to target variety specific regions, but that's sort of counterbalanced by it's much easier for them to sell fewer varieties, produce and sell fewer varieties across larger areas. So there's a balance that they have to uh, maintain in order to make their operations um, commercially profitable. So that may not really get us to the level of diversity that I would like to see in the crop. Technology has to be changing your, uh, your environment a lot. You have more plant breeding tools at your disposal than ever before. Um, scientists are making rapid progress in mapping genomes. What does the technology allow you to do today and, and how has that changed over the course of your career? You've been doing this for a couple of years now. Yeah, almost 20. It's been a long time. <laughs> the big, big change, uh, uh, I would say, is probably in, in sequencing technologies, DNA sequencing. and, and Combined with that, I think computational improvements. And those two things together really have revolutionized things in ways I couldn't have imagined when I was working on my PhD, for example. So what it allows us to do now is we can, uh, we have traits that are very difficult to evaluate in the field accurately. And what the DNA markers allow us to do is to do an experiment where you don't evaluate all the germplasm in your program, but you can evaluate a subset of it and you can do it very carefully and you need good field measurements. That hasn't gone away. But what the DNA markers allow you to do is to take those measurements, build something like a prediction model that, so that you can uh, sort of predict with some level of accuracy how the phenotypes for those traits would be on lines that you haven't even put in the field yet. And what that allows us to do if, as these genotyping costs go down and our ability to use these computational methods to do these predictions improves, we can essentially 
basically double or triple the size of our breeding programs effectively by using this DNA marker information. Um, where we can't really, at the same cost, we couldn't just increase the phenotyping or the field-based experimentation level. Right, right. Big changes. Big changes. And it's pretty clear that if used properly that these methods can really improve the gain from selections that we can make. Right. I know one of the focuses of some of your work is fusarium. And right. as our listeners know, fusarium can lead to a toxin that right. can be uh, dangerous to animals and to people. Right. Are, are, are farmers close to being able to expect fusarium-resistant corn? Well, I should say that there, we don't know of anything that's immune. There's no known variety that will be resistant under all conditions. Okay. However, there are big differences in the uh, level of susceptibility or sort of the quantitative kinds of resistance you can get. And, and clearly, we have material in our program that's much more resistant uh, than other things. It's, again, not immune, so it's not 100% effective but it can greatly reduce the uh, amount of infection you get and can greatly reduce the levels of the mycotoxin. Uh, and industry has also been developing some materials and we're trying to, again, bring in new genes from exotic material that improve the fusarium resistance, get them into an adapted background, and hopefully those materials could be picked up by the commercial companies and turned into products that the farmers will use. So I think we're pretty close to having much better levels of resistance. I don't know that we can't guarantee complete immunity, though. Kim, thanks very much for your time. Thank I you very much. It. Appreciate it.